Now, finally, let us have a few words about power BJTs. Now, as I said, in, in a, a power uh, amplifier application, you need to use special BJTs, especially if you are talking about applications with kind of let us say greater than a few watts, then you need to use uh, BJTs which are special BJTs. Now, uh, a, a typical example I, I gave was uh, 2N3055. So, when we talk about power BJTs, we can think of a few examples. Now, this 2N3055 as I said has a power dissipation of uh, 125 watts, which is very high. Now, this is an NPN transistor and we know that you need a PNP also. If you want a class AB amplifier, then you need both PNP and NPN. So, normally in the market you would get something called ECP and ECN, which are both made in our country, I think by ECIL and both are actually matched. So, you can think of both of them as in the same family with the same kind of power dissipation and uh, you need to use a pair of them. So, they are meant for typically fairly high. Now, occasionally you have applications which may not require that high. Now, the problem with uh, these BJTs so far, we were used to seeing BJTs with the three terminals. Now, if you look at a 2N3055, the device would look something like this. Now, you would find only two terminals, one of them is an, uh, the base terminal, one of them is the emitter terminal. Now, one would wonder where is the collector terminal. Now, the body itself is the collector terminal. Now, you might remember from our discussion of BJTs in our first lecture on BJTs, you will remember that in a BJT, the collector junction, the collector region has the largest area. Now, this is done at that time we said this is done from the point of view of power dissipation. So, in all metallic even small transistors, even metallic transistors, it is a common practice to tie the collector to the metallic case. So, the collector is generally tied to the metallic case. Now, in the example of this particular transistor 2N3055, how do I make a connection to the to the, the collector now? Because I do not have a terminal, how do I solder or how do I physically connect? Now, therefore, uh, maybe those of you who have already used this particular uh, device might know. Now, if you go to the market, what they provide is, you know, these devices are generally mounted on heat sinks. Now, as, as I said, one of the problems in a power amplifier as compared to the small signal amplifiers we talked about so far is, in all power amplifiers irrespective of whatever is efficiency, you would have the problem of power dissipation and that is a problem we have to live with. So, you need to think about ways by which you are able to dissipate the power efficiently. Now, the way it is done is in a transistor like this 2N3055, the way it is done is the metallic case is made large, the area of the, the outside area is made large and on the top of that you are expected to mount this particular device on a heat sink, on an aluminum heat sink. So, Now, I would encourage all of you in your own remote centers, if you have the, uh, if you have a kind of a public address system available, maybe during tea break, you could have a look at the power amplifier, because power amplifiers are very easy to locate. The, the simplest thing is a, your standard uh, public address system, which is used. Now, if you look at the rear of that particular 
power ampli power uh, I mean the public address system, you would see one of these transistors most of the time 2 and 3 sort of 5 is used and then you would see how it is connected. So, the way it is done is you would have uh, because if you connect if you directly touch the body which is the collector to the heat sink you cannot put a second device you have to then insulate this particular one from the body of the instrument. So, what is actually done is you would use a electrical insulator, but at the same time something which would conduct heat. So, what is actually done is you would use a kind of a mica kind of a sheet. So, these are things which is very nice to uh, maybe show to students when you teach this particular topic and uh, those of those students who may be doing it they may be seeing. So, it is very nice to see. So, the way you would connect is you need to have some kind of a screw, screw arrangement by which you would tie the collectors. So, you would you would connect a kind of a, a nut and a bolt and normally it is kind of a, a good a kind of a brass a screw and uh, then you would put the mica sheet on the top of these the one before you actually mount it to the heat sink. Now, with this arrangement the purpose of this is whatever uh, heat generated in the device is easily kind of dissipated in the uh, heat sink. Now, if this, this is not done as we saw right in the beginning the device can get damaged. Now, there is something which is extremely important to remember. Now, we need to we need to differentiate between the junction temperature and the outside temperature. Now, we need to think about the junction temperature as compared to the outside temperature. Now, as far as the device is concerned what is important is the junction temperature. So, the junction temperature should be kept let us say much less than 150 degree centigrade. 100 degree centigrade is the boiling point of uh, water and we all know how hot it is. So, and generally if you do not have a good heat dissipation your hand will literally burn if you touch one of these devices. So, the you need to ensure that the junction temperature is much smaller, but unfortunately right from the junction to the outside. Now, how efficiently it is connected depends on. So, the outside temperature in an actual device the outside temperature of the device if uh, if you if the junction temperature is T 1 and the outside temperature is T 2 then you would see that uh, ideally T 1 should be equal to T 2. So, that it dissipated easily, but actually you would see that T 1 would be greater than T 2. So, that shows how efficiently or it is it is it is done. Now, this is done in the in the in the case of uh, a power transistor uh, normally this is expressed in the in by an equation which is called T j minus T a is equal to theta j a times P d. This is an equation which is used to express this particular problem we are talking about. Now, what this says is the junction temperature minus the ambient temperature is what is called a thermal resistance. This is this theta j a is called the thermal resistance times the power dissipation. Now, how good or bad the heat sink or your heat dissipation scheme we are using depends on how small this value of thermal resistance is. Now, you you the the lower this value of theta j is the better the heat dissipation is. Now, the most common way of dissipating heat is through heat sinks. However, the problem with the heat sink is you the it takes too much space. Now, in very sophisticated instruments there is another way of uh, dissipating heat or rather keeping the device cooler. One very important thing to remember in the case of a heat sink is that even in the ideal case the temperature you can achieve is only the ambient temperature. So, if you are talking about a room temperature of 30 degrees you are talking about at best the junction temperature being 30 degrees. 
let us say that you have an application where you want to keep the device at much lower temperature than the ambient temperature. In such cases, you would use what are called thermoelectric coolers to ensure that the device is kept cool. Now, what is important to notice here is uh, this topic of power dissipation in the context of a, a power BJ is extremely important. The again there is a common there is a sketch which is drawn to express the importance of uh, dissipating heat. Now, what what I am what I am drawing here is what is called the equation which shows the relationship Now, for every device, every I'm sorry, I'll draw it in again. So, every for every BJT power BJT, you would the manufacturer would give you a a, a characteristic like this, which shows the relationship between the power dissipation. So, what we have this is essentially showing the, the maximum power dissipation and uh, T A 0, T J max I will just come to this in a minute. Now, what this is telling is so you have uh, So, what this particular one is telling is assuming that a device like a 2 and 3 0 5 5 this 125 watts which we talked about is a case provided you are operating it at the ambient temperature. As you keep increasing the ambient temperature the and the extreme is the maximum junction temperature. So, let us say the maximum junction temperature let us say is 120 degrees or so. Now, at that particular temperature, the device cannot dissipate any power. So, you this is the best situation. So, if you can keep the device at the ambient temperature say 25 degrees, you will get the maximum power dissipation. Now, as your device gets hotter and hotter, the power dissipation comes down drastically. So, this is a very, very important consideration. So, this is why heat sinks are very important. Now, uh, we could go on. So, at this particular stage, we will let us let us just uh, reca have a, a quick recap on what we discussed today. So, what we discussed today was we talked about power amplifiers and we saw in uh, some detail about their uh, classification. One of the first things we said is we said when we talk about power amplifiers we generally do not talk about the kind of amplifiers which we are used to the common emitter, common base and common collector amplifiers. Now, in those kind of amplifiers we were only concerned about the signal gain, input resistance, output resistance and so on, but we when, it, when we talk about power amplifiers we said we have some other very important considerations. Now, these considerations are we need to ensure in these amplifiers that the output resistance are extremely small. When we say small, we are talking about say maybe uh, an ohm or even much less depends on the current. Another very, very important here is the how linear our power amplifier is. And as I said, we never worried about total harmonic distortion in a common emitter amplifier, because if we could ensure that the input signal is within say a few few millivolts or 10 millivolt or even 20 millivolt, we would get reasonably good linear output, we will get a good output. But in the case of a power amplifier, because we are talking about large signals, 
we will always have distortion. Now, the, the issue is how small can I make my distortion. The third consideration, which again was never a consideration for us, is the efficiency. This was never a consideration for us so far in all our discussions, but uh, in the discussion of power amplifiers, as we saw in the case of class A, class B, we saw that efficiency is an extremely important parameter here. This is because of the reason that from two, point, two points of view, the major interest is that whatever power you are not delivering to the load, that much power you have to dissipate on the device. Now, just now I drew the, the thermal characteristics of a typical transistor and we saw that the, uh, the more the power dissipation, more is the temperature, more is the, the, the device would get hotter and hotter and the more the device get uh, uh, I mean hot, you, it, you need to dissipate this power. Therefore, the, the one of the best option to take care of this problem is to use a scheme which is highly efficient, so that this problem is taken care of. And also, we if, if there are applications where, you know, especially kind of mobile or portable applications, you need to ensure that battery drain is reduced. Now, we said that very special transistors are used in this power amplifiers. They are power transistors, and uh, they have power dissipation capabilities from a few watts to hundreds of watts. And uh, we talked about the classification of power amplifiers and we said this is classified on the basis of the, the operating current, the DC operating current and the signal current. In the case of a class A amplifier, we said that the DC operating current I C is chosen such that it is greater than the peak of the input sinusoid. Now, by doing this, we are ensuring that at all instants, the device is on, it is conducting. So, therefore, we are guaranteed to have extremely uh, low distortion here. So, this is called class A amplifier. Now, coming to class B, this is a situation where we use two devices and one device conducts for one half cycle and the second device a kind of complementary device works for the other half cycle. So, in the case of a class B, the conduction is only for a half cycle as opposed to a class A, where the conduction is the entire 360 degrees. So, two devices are required here in the case of class B. Now, class C we said is a very, very special case and this is used only for very high power application such as a transmitting station or so where the powers we are talking about are extremely high. By the way, class C obviously would be much more efficient than sorry, class C would be much more efficient than class B and the kind of typical efficiency you can get in a class C application, class C amplifier is in the order of 87 or almost close to 90 percent. Now, these are used and very special, so we will not worry about this. Now, what is of interest to us is class B. Now, there is another class called a class A B and uh, this we saw later why it was required. So, we set class A. Now, class A amplifier we considered the transfer characteristic and uh, we saw that it is a linear characteristic and we said that this is very good. The minus point here was when we did the power conversion efficiency calculations, we saw that the maximum efficiency you could get is only 25 percent. Actually, in most of the times you will not even get 25 percent, you might get only somewhere between 10 to 20 percent. So, therefore, we said this is a very bad choice from the point of view of an output transistor. Then we considered a class B output stage, where we said you need two devices, one device for one half cycle. So, the positive half cycle is taken care of by the top device negative half cycle by the bottom device. But here we said unfortunately, because there is no biasing when the input signal is 0, no current flows and the, the you need a, a, a minimum of say around 0.5 volts for this particular uh, device to turn on. So, till that point 
no current flows, because of which we said we get what is called a dead zone. So, in the transfer characteristic we get a dead zone. So, which means say roughly between say plus 5 minus 5 plus so plus 0.5 minus 0.5. So, that is a period we see that there is a dead zone which result in what is called crossover distortion. Now, we saw that from the point of view of power conversion efficiency class B is very good, we can get as high as 78 percent and we also said the power dissipation in a class B depends on the input signal as opposed in the case of class A, we saw that the dissipation is maximum and there is no signal, whereas in the case of a class B, when there is no input signal, there is no power, power, power dissipation, device is not on. But once you apply signal, the power dissipation keeps increasing and it reaches a peak for the case of 2 VCC by pi and at that particular point, you have an efficiency of 50 percent and for the value of a peak input signal of VCC with a peak of VCC, you get an efficiency of 78.5 percent. So, we said class B is very good from the point of efficiency, but it has crossover distortion because of the dead zone around 0 volts and therefore, is bad. And in this context, we, we studied class A B amplifier, where we said what was done was a very, very small bias was applied. This is to make sure, take care of the dead zone and we said this biasing has to be done extremely carefully, otherwise we would go from the, we want a situation as close as possible to class B and therefore, we would choose a bias very carefully, so that it is just at the verge of conduction, so that we get efficiency the same time without getting much distortion. And we said if you can ensure that, then you would get a linear characteristics and therefore, ideally no distortion. And we talked about a scheme which is very commonly used in ICs, where you would choose a current based on the voltage you require here and by changing the current you could you could choose any value of voltage here and this has another big plus point one of the minus points in a power amplifier is the heat generated and we know that vb voltage is highly sensitive to temperature now here because the biasing scheme is also using semiconductor device they would all change together so if the they have a negative temperature coefficient they also have a negative temperature coefficient they will change together therefore, we will not have thermal runaway. So, this kind of a scheme is generally used to ensure that you do not get a thermal runaway even when there is heat. So, then finally, we talked about power BJTs, we took the example of, uh, we took the example of a few power transistors and we talked about the importance of heat sink. So, this brings us to the end of this particular talk here. Uh, lecture. I hope you uh, followed the lecture here. The only thing to remember in this particular case is the considerations for a power amplifier are entirely different from the considerations we had for all the other amplifiers we studied so far. So, thank you.